The conference is now being recorded. Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BASIS quarterly conference call and audio webcast to discuss the company's 2018 third quarter results. You can log in to the audio webcast via BASIS uh, website www.basis.com. Joining us today are Mr. Richard Blickman, CEO, and Mr. Korte Hennepe, Senior Vice President Finance. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, this conference is being recorded and cannot be reproduced in whole or in part without written permission from the company. I would now like to turn over the call to Mr. Richard Blickman. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. We will begin by making a few comments in connection with the press release we issued earlier today and then take questions. I would like to remind you that some of the comments made during this call and some of the answers in response to your questions by management may contain forward-looking statements. Such statements may involve uncertainties and risks as described in the earnings release and other reports filed with the AFM. For today's call, we'd like to review the key highlights for our third quarter and nine-month results and also spend some time updating you on the market, our strategy, and the outlook. First, some overall thoughts on the past quarter and the first nine months. For Q3, revenue of 116.7 million euros and a net income of 29.3 million euros compared favorably to expectations. Revenue came in at the midpoint of guidance higher than anticipated gross margins of 58% due primarily to a more favorable product mix and an 8.5% decrease in sequential operating expenses helped keep Basie's net margins in excess of 25% despite a 27.6% sequential revenue decrease. In addition, orders of 107.9 million euros increased by 25% versus the second quarter as demand recovered for mobile applications by Asian customers. Cash generation recovered as well, with net cash increasing by 49.9 million euros versus the second quarter 2018 to reach 160.1 million euros. Basie's nine-month 2018 results reflect solid performance and strategic execution in an assembly equipment market more challenging than 2017. Revenue of 432.7 million euros and a net income of 113.5 million euros declined by 1.5% and 12.4% respectively versus the comparable period of the prior year. Our 2018 revenue development was affected by a first half slowdown in the high-end mobile demand followed by weakness in memory and user markets in the third quarter, quarter partially offset by more favorable trends experienced in automotive and computing applications. Basie responded to such challenges by rapidly aligning production supply chain and personal levels to new market realities. As a result, we've been able to maintain high levels of profitability in the current market environment. Our liquidity position improved significantly this quarter. We ended the quarter with cash and deposits of 443.5 million euros, or 5.97 euros per share, equal to almost 33% of Basie's stock price of 18.17 at such date. In addition, cash flow from operations of 65.7 million euros grew by almost 58.7 million euros sequentially due primarily to reduce working capital needs as we collected receivables and scaled back the supply chain. Basic strong cash flow generation continues to support a shareholder-friendly capital allocation program. During the third quarter, we repurchased 593,000 shares for a total of 11.2 million euros, 
Of that amount, 9.6 million euros related to the new repurchase program announced at the end of July. This brings total distribution to shareholders this year to 196.5 million euros and 470.7 million euros since 2011. I'd next like to speak a little bit about the current market environment. The headwinds we experienced post Q1 spread to other equipment manufacturers in the third quarter with downward revisions to second half order forecast by many companies. Reflecting changing market sentiment, VLSI recently took down its 2018 assembly equipment forecast from a revised 12% in April to under 3% recently. It sees a shallow downturn in 2019 of 3.5%, followed by another upward move in 2020 with new customer investment rounds. The real question is whether the challenging conditions experienced this year reflect a temporary pulse or a larger industry downward move. We don't have an answer to that currently given limited visibility, relatively short cycle times and conflicting market signals. VSI's estimate assumes that favorable GDP trends and high capacity utilization rates will limit the depth of any 2019 downturn. Now let me take a few moments to discuss some of our strategic initiatives in the current market environment. Periodic revenue volatility is nothing new to our industry. In fact, periods of less robust growth let us further refine our strategy and financial potential to capitalize on the next major industry upturn. As you can see on this chart, we took action in the second quarter this year to scale back headcount, primarily temporary production personnel, once we saw that market conditions were weakening. Our objective is to reduce total headcount by approximately 16% by year end. In addition, BASIC continues to reduce European headcount and has pruned back fixed headcount in certain Asian locations post the large production ramp last year. By way of such actions, we aim to keep net margins and cash generation well above prior trough levels. From a longer term perspective, we're on track to reduce analyzed structural costs by 15 to 20 million euros over the next three years. We are keenly focused on initiatives to increase BASIS market presence, the revenue growth, and market share in the next customer investment rounds. A particular focus is expanding our reach in the logic and memory markets in the era of the cloud and the big data. This could involve increased market share by flip chip versus wire bond equipment due to the increased complexity, accuracy, and miniaturization requirements of next generation applications. In the mobile market, we're looking to roll out new camera imaging and other features for 5G networks to help expand our presence in both the Android and iPhone worlds, particularly with Korean and Chinese customers. Another major initiative is to expand BASIS revenue potential with the Japanese automotive supply chain, as well as with existing customers. In parallel, current development activities are focused on providing customers leading edge advanced packaging processes such as TCB, fan out wafer level, panel, and wafer molding for next generation devices. Now a couple of words about our fourth quarter outlook. As most of you know, Basie's business is seasonal with revenue and orders typically building in the first half of a year and sequentially receding in the second half. Over the past seven years, Q3 revenue has decreased an average of 16.1%, followed by another decline of 11% in the fourth quarter versus the third quarter. This year, the decreases are the upper bands of the H2 seasonality. Looking specifically to the fourth quarter, we estimate that revenue will decline by 20 to 25 percent sequentially due to seasonal patterns and challenging industry conditions generally. We also anticipate that our gross margin should range between 54 and 56 percent due to a less favorable dye bonding product mix than in the third quarter. Gross margin levels are still very healthy considering 
H2 revenue trends. Finally, we guide Q4 OPEX to be flat with the third quarter, as the impact of some second half cost reductions is not yet reflected in our quarterly OPEX totals. That ends my prepared remarks. I would like to open the call for some questions. Operator. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question or remark, you can press star 1. The first question comes from Mr. Nigel van Putten. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon, guys, and uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, two of them more of a, of a long-term perspective. First on your revenue initiatives. That's a very interesting slide you added to the pack. Um, I count about six initiatives, um, including some of the, the things we've heard before, fan out wave level packaging, TCB, uh, but also, I think, new to me, expand in the Japanese automotive supply chain. Um, out of these six initiatives, do you think this could all be sort of 2019 business, or is this more of a, of a longer-term view? And, and I, I guess some of them would be more near-term, some of them would be long-term. And, and could you please maybe uh, give us an indication what you expect more near-term and more long-term? Well, excellent. Um, first of all, every customer today has suppliers. So in order to gain market share, either you offer better products or there are issues with the current supply chain. Um, in downturns, it's typically the time to um, challenge, and also our equipment is challenged by our existing customers versus competition, and also with new departments to be introduced in the next technology round. So overall, this gives you an opportunity to test um, um, new opportunities, which usually only are in an evaluating stage in the downturn and may lead to new market share gains in the next upturn. So that's how it typically works. Why did we list these? Well, this is not new. If you look at our development over the past decade, step by step, we have increased the top 10 customer revenues. Um, 10 years ago, the top five did about 60%. Today, it's the top 10. So the challenge we face is to increase that further. Does that answer your question? Sorry, yeah, that, no, that's clear. I mean, um, maybe, maybe more specifically, uh, I think maybe just an update on something, some of the things we heard before, like Ferrat wafer level packaging, TCB panel, and, and wafer level uh, packaging. Uh, I think in, in the upturn, I think in the conversations you had with us is that customers were too busy just ramping product and, and, and getting stuff out there, and indeed in the downturn would maybe reevaluate some of these um, uh, these initiatives. For instance, TCB it's been it's been rather quiet I think for the last year or two. Uh, would that be something that you have any visibility on of returning, or is it more these are you know things in general that that you're working on and and, and in the next upturn they they could. Um, potentially help, or, or is there any more visibility on it? Well, you have to be a bit more um, specific. There are two areas of um, um, ongoing development and potential change. So for fanout and TCB, it's very important that the next technology round forces these new developments to become mainstream. That's not clear yet. So those customers which are testing these technologies are um, continuing that, and, and it could very well be that this is also tied to the 14 nanometer uh, design era towards 10 that may open up some of these new technologies. But in the existing world, there's also a uh, picking order in existence. And our equipment, of course, is evaluated on an ongoing basis, same with competitors. But as we share with many of you, and you can find that on, on, on our quarterly presentation, we are always introducing new features on our existing machines, either tighter accuracies or 
combination of accuracy and speed, also reducing cost initiatives. So you're pushing the existing envelopes and you should try to prepare yourself better for real technology changes. So that's a combination. But as we've said many times, every new round is like a deck of cards. You, you have new opportunities. Right, no, that's clear. Maybe, maybe just one final question then on the um, the annual cost savings target of 15 to 20 million by 2021. This quarter already strong, but I think more temporary cost savings. Um, but given you know perhaps the market um, challenging environment, how is the phasing of these cost savings into the next couple of years? We should we maybe expect, depending on market conditions, maybe a bit more near term, or is it more of a run rate towards 20 million in uh, in 2021? The 15 to 20 million is three main programs. Number one is moving west to east of all kinds of support functions. Huh? On an ongoing basis, we are moving um, more than operations. The administration, the server support, technical support out of the support lab in Singapore, and that is ongoing. Then. The second bucket is supply chain, further improving the Asian supply chain. That's an ongoing challenge. Third is common modules, common platforms. In our machines, we have 18 different platforms. Mm -hmm. There are numerous opportunities to further reduce the cost by changing certain designs. And in downturns, typically, those are the improvements next to the technology, as we discussed in the first question, to, to structurally reduce your cost. And, and by streamlining your supply chain, reduce your cycle times. Cycle times are, are fantastic already, mm -hmm. but they can still be much better. So some are shorter term, some are longer term. It's a combination. And that's why every year we should see certain achievements in reducing cost. Right, that's very clear. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Peter Olofsson. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, maybe the first on memory, uh, both in the press release and in the introduction, you referred to some weakness in memory and user markets in Q3. Um, I always had the impression that uh, your exposure to mainstream DRAM and NAND was rather modest. Um, so the weakness that you referred to, is that mainly linked to hybrid uh, memory? Uh, and related to that, um, could you provide some update on the progress you see uh, in terms of uh, TCB, uh, either in, in hybrid memory or in other applications? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the number of customer engagements uh, and when you expect uh, a more meaningful uh, contribution to your sales. And, and then I have some uh, follow-ups. Okay. Well, uh, very good. Yes, you're correct. Memory has always been a smaller portion of our revenue, somewhere around 10 and and it's sometimes slightly above 10% of revenue. Still, that is an important part, and if tide goes out on other areas, and then in addition, mem memory held on pretty long until September, August, September. So that that was also for us um, an, a negative impact. On TCB development, it's quite interesting. We mentioned also in the comments um, for memory, there's a distinct move towards flip chip as a next step beyond wire bonds. Testing that flip chip will maybe lead in a generation from now towards more TCB. But still, TCB is, is slow. Slow because of not needed yet that is tied to 40 nanometers to 10 delay. It is also tied simply to 
improved flip chip capabilities from 5 micron down to 3 micron. Um, also multi-head die bonders, flip chip die bonder introductions. So that could further delay TCB, but it makes flip chip far more exciting. And, and do you see yeah. uh, progress in, in TCB in other applications? Well, in certain logic, but still not across the board, only in very specific applications. Okay. Um, then I have a follow-up on uh, automotive. Um, so on the one hand, we have seen weaker car sales in China. Uh, in Europe, we have seen the impact from a WLTP. Uh, but on the other hand, we see the structural growth in semiconductor content in, in vehicles. Um, so how is that overall playing out in terms of short-term uh, demand? Um, how, how is that affecting the um, investment plans of, of your customers? Well, there are two things. Um, one is volume, huh? is the GDP-related automotive market. However, yeah. there are, as you, as you very well um, mentioned, um, some some disappointments in that sense. But then what basic strength is in that market, their new packaging, advanced packaging type of solutions, smaller um, power and, and also in, in other areas of, of automotive, which have been developed in the previous downturn which have been ramped to full production in the last two years. And we've specifically benefited from those changes, not from the volume increase. So, as always, it is a mix. Um, but that also leads to the comment, don't expect automotive, historically that has been the case, huh? to overtake growth of the other two drivers in the industry. So communication, mobile internet devices, and also computers, huh? they have stronger growth drivers than automotive. But automotive is, is between 15 and 20 percent of our revenue for a long time, and, and We've, we've gained also market share in automotive in the last two, three years, especially in the last year with, with the ramp. And, and that may also lead to further market share gains in the automotive, as indicated in the comments. Okay, but, but, but at this moment you don't see any hesitation from your clients to, to, to cut back on, on spending, given all the uncertainty in their end market. Not, I would say not yet. This, you would only see that once GDP starts to slow down. Okay. Um, and then my final question is uh, around M&A. Um, so you clearly you have an M&A uh, war chest following the issuance of two convertibles in recent years. Um, now we have seen uh, the valuation of your own stock uh, coming down, but, but also for, for listed peers. Um, but has that also resulted in the expectations of, of potential sellers uh, becoming more realistic? Well, you have to look at it more um, fundamentally. Yeah? When do people sell? There are two, two periods in, in, in general. One is selling in an upturn, huh? and, and the next one is in in a downturn when certain customer or um, company specific metrics do not offer better growth in future cycles. To be more specific, skill is important, certain capabilities, longer term growth and, and development of, of operations on a global basis, and in downturns, those 
consolidation or or real um, integration of companies leading to more optimum cost structures are being evaluated. And depending upon the length of a down cycle, more or less of these opportunities are being investigated. And basically, we've been very clear all along. For us, it's only interesting to look at acquisitions which improve our market position towards our customers, but moreover, improve our margin structure. And, and that is the key to look at. We are not dreaming of increasing scale and by that increasing margins. Margins are product related, so you have to look at potential improving above the current mar margin structures. And then you're referring to the cross margin or, or, or the EBIT margin? Always gross margin. In yeah. equipment business, number one is gross margin because that's the value customers are there provide to specific products. Okay. Um, th th then my final question, which relates to the mobile market. Um, I, I noticed that order intake was up in Q3 compared to with Q2. Uh, and you you refer to higher bookings for mobile applications. Um, so is that an indication that in that particular market uh, the worst may be behind, um, or or is there also some quarter volatility in play, uh, and therefore we we should not read too much in that uh, pickup. Well, as you can see in slide, um, I think it's 24. Uh, the inside of a high-end smartphone, we're involved in many of the components in those products. And um, those components also have specific cycles. In addition, customers are always improving those specific modules in terms of yield and in terms of cost. So the orders in the third quarter were related to other parts in those mobile devices than in the first half of the year, but still highly attractive. But it's not a new round of smartphones. It is improvements, additions to, to the current generation. And but, but when you say improving the current generation, you, you, you're referring to uh, packaging technology or current generation of smartphone features? Features. Features. Yeah, okay. yeah. So all those features, they all have a life cycle. And they all have, they, they are not all, let's say, succeeded at the same time. So there are certain features which have been introduced last year. Some of those processes can be improved. So that's why we had a substantial amount of certain kits onto those machines, improving the yield and, and increasing the output of those machines. And there were some new features, but also in the existing technology generation. Maybe in a year or, yeah, that's, that's the usual pattern, huh? two or three years, you have a whole new generation. So 17 was the launch, 18 improvement year, 19 maybe preparation for a next round. That's, that's the typical cycle. There's also a slide in our presentation going back to 2006 in the appendix where you see those generations over time. Okay, this is helpful. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Paul Maran. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to pick up on the statement about the cycle, whether it is a traditional downturn or not. I mean, who really knows? But 
in your words, would you describe 2015 as a traditional downturn for Bezzi? Yes. I mean, 14 was a peak. 17 was a peak. 18 is, is let's say, a sunset of the 17 cycle. And those are very usual patterns. And 16 was a slower year, and 17 was the next peak. Mm. And in terms of seasonality, you've been very clear on how that works, certainly from a revenue point of view. Would you also expect the type of seasonality that you've seen from an order booking point of view do you think that will be maintained, or are we in such a volatile period that you can't really say that about what's going to happen in Q1? Well, if you you can't say, uh, you're very right. Uh, our, as we said in the comments, our visibility is typically a quarter. Also, our customers, if you simply map the, the end customers, they, they also don't provide that visibility. So... Then you have to look at patterns, and the patterns are usually stronger first half than second half because of consumer end products, which are mostly launched in, in the second half of the year. So production is built up in the first half and more towards the second quarter then. So whether it's a slower year or a stronger growth year, the seasonal patterns have mostly been been as they are. But that's to be seen. It's too early to tell. Understood. And just a clarification, just if we look at the, it's on orders again, if we look at Q2 and we look at the 86 million euros that was booked in Q2, is that including the order cancellation, the missing 28 million that got cancelled? Yes. So, That's in there. Okay. so for clear understanding, huh, actually, those orders should not have been placed in the first quarter. Right. So, yeah, in in numbers and 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 it's right, huh? But you, but your statement is very correct. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. The next question is from uh, Mr. Antoine. Burkhardt. Your line is open. Oh, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, just a real quick one on the balance sheet. Um, I see you, obviously, after the two emission of the two convertible bonds, boasting fairly significant um, liquidity resources now. Um, how much of that do you actually need to run the business on an ongoing basis? And uh, I guess the previous call did mention M&A opportunities, but I was just wondering, um, is there an opportunity, given where some of your convertible bonds are trading at the moment, for you to apply some of that liquidity to uh, buy back bonds? Well, that's an interesting thought. We've done that in the past. Huh? We issued our first convert in 2005. We bought back in 2008 um, at the second half when, when markets started to deteriorate. At very attractive terms, about 40% of that outstanding convert. That's not the case today yet, but uh, you're very right. If you see at our cash flow generation, uh, we don't need to convert for our own operation. But as always mentioned, we use additional capital for strategic objective. And as I answered to a previous question, yes, there are certainly m a opportunities in this world huh? and and the best is to be prepared for that and especially situations in downturns which then um, offers our shareholders far more attractive returns than financing those acquisitions in downturns so we have a history of raising capital in upturns and and spending it wisely on strategic developments in, in downturns. Okay, that's uh, very helpful. Thank you. 
Next question is from Mr. Robert Sanders. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm actually joined a little bit later. Apologies if you answered this in your opening remarks, but uh, I just had a question on the China tariffs. Um, you know, a lot of the IDMs use packages in China, uh, and it does seem like they're looking to go to the Philippines and Malaysia quite fast. I was just wondering, on your China business only, have you seen any hesitation uh, from those packaging companies, uh, given the, 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 the threat of tariffs? Um, and I've got a couple of follow-ups. Thanks. Yes. Well, the answer is yes. Um, and it's widely publicized. Huh? Um, so there will be a reset of, of capacities in, in the region. Some are expanding in Vietnam, some are in the Philippines, some in Taiwan. Um, so that's happening. Got it. And so uh, presumably then that means that companies have to requalify lines in these new countries. Uh, but once they do, presumably that could actually lead to more demand for your, for your tools as they qualify and ramp up and, and the other tools in China stay idle? Or is that something you think is not significant? Well, I, I would like to say it differently. The risk you run is that this leads to an overcapacity. So um, having, having multiple production volumes is, is potentially a risk to utilization rates, but not at this moment yet. Got it. Um, and just a couple more questions. So you, you obviously had a great year in 2017 led by uh, a major OEM and what they were doing uh, on the front side of their device. I was just wondering, uh, given the, how active they are on, the, on their solution for the world-facing side, um, whether you thought that that opportunity, whether it ramps in 2019 or 2020, nobody knows, I think at this stage, most people seem to think 2020, whether that opportunity could be as big as it was for you in 2017. Because um, you know, I think that could potentially be uh, you know, a big recovery thing driver for you. But I'm just interested whether you might see some reuse of the existing tools out there. Well, um, reuse um, is, is not to be expected. But if things go as they go, uh, and, and, and then yeah, look again at the slide going back to 2006, where you see in every cycle, we have increased uh, substantially, 2010, 2014, 17. We've done our homework right. You can see that in the margins. Um, if we continue to do the development right, uh, there could be a significant higher um, next round again. And that's, of course, our challenge. But there's, Got it. Okay. our chances have improved. OK, great. And just last question for me. Um, given the, the yield issues that are, are well known at, at, at uh, the major US IDM, uh, at 10 nanometer, I w it seems to me one of the issues, you know, along with many other issues, is that the die size is too large, and they do seem to be uh, moving in this kind of chiplet direction, um, as are a lot of the foundry customers as well. I was just wondering if you were to see a kind of wholesale migration to this chiplet approach rather than having large dies. How significant could that be for your business, and uh, you know, how how material it could be in the next couple of years? Thank you. We're, we're, we're developing on both fronts. So the challenge for the large dies is clearly, for all of us, an opportunity. Yeah? And um, uh, also accuracies further decrease. Huh? So, so that's one direction. And the other direction is, of course, multiple dies to solve that. Um, those are very... Yeah, significant developments for next year, and and in a year from now, we we will know much more. But it's fair to say that Bayesi is involved in in all these developments. And, and got it. And it, it could be a material driver rather than you know, so not just a kind of two percent of revenue driver. You're talking about something quite material potentially. Yeah, it it will be the next generation mainstream, but with the extension of the 14 nanometer world, 
that also does us pretty well. OK, great. Thanks a lot. Next question is from Mr. Edwin de Jong. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Mm. Good afternoon, gentlemen. A few questions left um, also on, on, on um, what is your direct exposure now still uh, to, the, to the export sector there? And, and are you thinking about changing your footprint or um, yeah, maybe elaborate a little bit on, on that? Um, if I understand you correctly, um, so if there are more investments outside of China? Yeah, by, by, by you. Are you extending, extending more uh, outside of China now? Well, you've extended quite fast in, uh, in, in the first few years in, uh, to, to uh, broaden your uh, Chinese footprint. That's very, um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, China capacity has been on top of the existing capacities in Malaysia. Yeah. Technology moves on, huh? so next generations are always first built up in Malaysia. And we are certainly capable to do more in Malaysia because we have offloaded step by step. By year end, we should be able to build all platforms in China. So that gives us the flexibility to do in both locations the existing product ranges. So we're very well fit for both. OK, so you're relatively independent on what was happening. Yeah, but we can also production. export out of China. China's very happy to export. Yeah, <laughs> they, are. they are. So it's not only for China, China, but of course that is most preferably but still, it is in an early phase, so it offers us great flexibility. Yeah. Okay, clear. Um, and then maybe a little bit on, on the M&A uh, opportunities. Um, can you maybe say a little bit on uh, are there more opportunities coming by in the, in the last few quarters than there were a year ago? Or Maybe give some some flavor. Are you looking at more more uh, propositions now, or uh, are you actually, yeah, you know, really looking at something now? Or well, how, we're always looking at, at the world because it's very exciting. But it's fair to say that in the um, second half of a cycle, huh, sunset, um, there are definitely more companies for sale than than in the first half of a cycle. So many smaller companies are typically for sale in, in that phase. And then mostly the companies with lesser margins, lesser product positions, yeah. and often issues. Um, and that's not what you're looking for, right? Well, it depends on, on, on the opportunity when things are in, in a better situation where it offers potentially higher margins. That's the only reason you should spend effort on that. But then um, um, everyone revisits a strategy, a big picture strategy in every cycle. And the bigger pictures are typically discussed more in, in, in the trough of a downturn. Clear. Clear. And, and, and finally, I think uh, Robert already asked uh, much on this, but the, the, in the free decency part, uh, one of your main clients, of course, is uh, uh, also extending into Android. Um, how, how, well, what are the consequences for you at the moment? Uh, how is the market looking for you? What, what, what is the potential now? Well, that, that not much has changed in that sense. The, any application with those technical requirements, but also there are more suppliers of, of 3D sensing, um, but also that technology is um, changing. In a sense, uh, multiple cameras, uh, uh, different uh, modules again, 
So there's a lot of development ongoing for the next generation where we are involved and hopefully we will we will benefit from from those new cycles. Okay. The last question is from Mr. Peter Olofsson. Your line is open. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for taking the follow-up. Um, it's about the gross margin, which was uh, above expectations in Q3. Um, in, in, in response to one of my earlier questions, you referred to selling uh, kind of upgrade uh, kits. Uh, is that what drove the, the gross margin upside, or were there uh, some other product categories uh, which were rather strong, like uh, like plating, for instance. Well, also again a good question. We have, I think, said several times that the mobile internet devices, as such, are not the highest margin products. That's a highly competitive world. So, the higher margins are in other applications. And the mix determines then the final margin. So we have many different products. Is it more plating? No. Um, but it's across the board. Otherwise, the margins are not in the high 50s. Huh? Um, so, yeah, some of it is is retrofits are, are higher margin. Sometimes they're not because there, there can be technical issues. Um, so it's it's not it's not easy to say it's because of this or because of that. Uh, no, but, Airport but support but, was also very strong with the ramp of the new uh, generation phones. Um, so there were, were many items contributing to, to a favorable market uh, mar margin development. Uh, okay, but at least the, the, the ad market mix was, was, was supported. Uh, but, but then still, um, you have a backlog and an order book going into the quarter. Um, so I would guess you have a reasonable insight to, to which customers you, you will ship. Yep. Um, so, so where did then the, the positive surprise come from? Um, basically, from, from the different mix compared to the second quarter of less high-end mobile product applications. So the percentage is less. But that's in general terms. And we had some favorable, um, yeah, other orders which had higher margins than we anticipated. Some supply chain improvements coming through, some cost savings. We had less underapplied. We expected due to the um, uh, decline that we would have a larger underapplied. But we were able to reduce our flexible headcount faster. So it's a combination. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Mr. Blickman, uh, there are two more questions. Is there any time? Of course. Yes. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Jim uh, Fontanelli. Your line is open. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, you. You touched on earlier the um, the opportunity around world facing, um, whether it comes in 2019 or, or 2020, I was just wondering whether you are agnostic around the the technology choice for world facing. So, whether it would be a you know primarily a structured light lead solution or a time of flight solution, uh, d does that make any difference to your overall uh, revenue opportunity into into world facing whenever it launches? Well, uh, uh, yes, but as said many times, those decisions are taken much later down the development path. Huh? We we can't we we can't make a judgment today whether whether 
this direction or that direction will prevail. And so you, are you in, a, in a, a development process that encompasses both of those potentials? Yes, but what could also happen is that the next generation are still being, being um, solved with existing. It's, it's very difficult. That was the disappointment we had in Q2, that the expected change of the design of a certain module simply was pushed out because the yield was unacceptable. Right. And then um, maybe just to follow up again on, uh, on the 2019 investment backdrop, but clearly uh, there, are, you know, there are two sort of big wafer migration programs sitting out there for, for you know, your largest foundry and, and logic customers to 7 and 7 plus and, and, to, and to 10 respectively. Uh, have you seen any of that, of, of, the, of the advanced packaging investment cycle sitting behind those two uh, sets of wafer migrations? Have you seen those yet in, in terms of order flow, or is that something we can expect later on um, you know, over the course of the next few quarters? Later on. It's still development phase. Great. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Robert Saunders. Your line is open. Sorry, just, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, just on your dividend policy, is it still, we should model still 80% of earnings? I mean, that seems to be the ballpark, but I just just was just wanted to check. Thanks. Well, it's between uh, 40 and 100%. Huh? So uh, we'll make that uh, call in, in um, February once we have the outcome for the full year and also the, um, a better view on, on 19. But that's, um, that's the range. Got it. Thank you. There are no further questions at this moment. Well, then I thank everyone for spending the time and, and the questions. Very interesting. When you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks. Goodbye.